Hello everyone. Today we will going to solve questions towards the midterm exam. Now um, we have a third order system, and for this third order system, we are going to design some controllers and uh, talk about uh, the design. So now the first question is to look for the stability interval for a p-type controller. Now usually when we are in the lab uh, during the laboratory sessions we use MATLAB a lot so therefore this um, session here will be uh, not using any MATLAB at all since uh, you will have a classical exam the solutions will be in the classical sense. So now um, we want to look for the stability interval for a p-type controller for the given system. Let's start with uh, the root locus method, but we need to sketch a root locus on ourselves and we need to uh, use the root locus properties rather than just coding it. So let's start with a p-type controller stability. Now, um, before we start with anything, we have to look at the transfer function here. And we can see we have 100 divided by s times s plus 2, s plus 5. So let me write it down here. s times s plus 2 s plus 5. Now the number of poles and the number of zeros in a transfer function for the open loop gives us a hint about the asymptotes on the root locus. So um, we have three poles, number of poles, and we have no zeros number of zeros. Therefore, our asymptote angles would be n minus m 60. Of course, not only 60, minus 60 and 180 are also our asymptote angles. So, um, we know the asymptotes. Where we can also find where the asymptotes coincide or the intersection point of the asymptotes can also be found. And it's something similar. For the uh, intersection point, we need to use the following formula. The sum of finite poles minus the sum of finite zeros and then divided by n minus m. So we have zero, we have a pole at the origin, we have minus two and we have minus five and we don't have any zeros so we can also technically we don't even need this part here. So, uh, this divided by 3 gives us minus 7 divided by 3, which is approximately equal to minus 2.333. So, of course, let me also give you the generalization here. We have basically um, We have actually 2k plus 1 here. I didn't write it down. Uh, so that would give us 2k plus 1, 60 times 2k plus 1, where k is 0, 1, 2, etc. So if you take 0, you will get 60. If you take 1, you would get 180, because this is 3. And also, if we take 2, 
it would be 300 degrees or it could also be written as minus 60 degrees. So these are the asymptote angles. This is the intersection point of the asymptotes. And since the system is already given in pole and zero uh, format, we can already see where the open loop zeros or poles are. So that's also a nice thing. If this is a polynomial with only coefficients, you have to work your way out. You have to uh, look for the open loop poles in order to sketch a root locus plot. So now let's sketch the root locus uh, roughly. And let's have this here. So this is sigma, this is j omega. Now we have a pole at the origin, let's place that. We have a pole here at minus two, and we have a pole at minus five. So two, two three, four, somewhere here, minus five. And let me change color. And this is uh, the intersection point here is somewhere around here. And then we would have a 60 degree angle here. And then another one here somewhere. And 180, of course, is the real axis here. So the root locus plot would look roughly like this. And then this one this one goes left. So this, this, and this. So we need this because we are trying to uh, look for the stability interval of the p-type controller. Now, um, this is the positive root locus. So if we are looking at this root locus plot, we know that k needs to be positive, or it is positive on this curve. But since we have a pole at the origin, we don't even need to sketch the negative root locus, because uh, we can see that this one is going to be passing through the j omega axis, or even the origin. If this is not on the uh, origin here, if it's somewhere else, let me quickly copy this. So if we, for example, move this pole a little bit, like this, then the root locus will still look like this, but the only difference would be the following. Uh, if we plot the negative root locus, which I'm not going to go into detail, but if it's going to be the negative root locus, then okay, let's get rid of that. then this pole would go through here and then these would coincide. And the only point that we would uh, consider would be this here, because this is again a j omega axis passing. So there would be a certain k value, a negative one, because we are on the negative root locus, that we should also consider and calculate. But in our case, for this special system, we have already a pole at the origin. Therefore, we don't need to check if we have a negative root locus uh, j omega passing, because we already have it uh, for this pole here. Now, let me quickly get rid of this. So what I mean is that you have to check the negative root locus generally, but for this system, it's not necessary. So. Let me again copy this one here. There we go. Hmm. 
Genau. For the stability, we are looking actually for this exact point here and also this one here. Now, um, since we know already that for K0, uh, we have a marginal stable st system, and if you look at the transfer function itself, it is already marginally stable. If you don't apply any p-type control, this is already marginally stable. Therefore, if we have negative k values, it will be unstable. And it can be seen from the root locus. Now, for the positive root locus plot, we need to find out where the uh, passing, wh which I've marked here in red, uh, is occurring. So therefore, we need uh, to uh, first find out where this happens and then find out which uh, gain causes this. So now in order to be able to calculate this here, we have to utilize or we can utilize the angle condition of the root locus. So angle condition. Now according to the angle condition, let me uh, plot this. Now, from this pole to this point, from this pole to this point, and from this pole to this point, I'm going to draw these vectors, these vectors. Now, at every point on the root locus plot, at every point, the angles, mm, let's take this one here, this one, let's say this is theta, let's say zero. Let's call this one theta minus two and theta minus five. We don't have any zeros, therefore we don't need to consider them, but generally we do, uh, we do consider them. So here, for every point on the root locus, the sum of these angles should be equal to 180 degrees. So if it's on the root locus, then theta zero plus theta minus 2 plus theta minus 5 should be equal to 180 degrees. So this is satisfied at each point. Even if I choose another point on this point, somewhere here, here, or anywhere else. And I don't, be, I don't really have to be on this uh, branch here. I might also choose this branch here. So uh, this is satisfied for all the points on the root locus plot. So, now luckily, even if I don't know what this point is, what the coordinate of this point is, one of the angles is already 90 degrees. So this is already 90 degrees because they share the same real value. Because this is already a 90 degrees angle. Now, in order to calculate theta minus 2 and theta minus 5, I do need the coordinate of this point, of this red point here which is the point of concern. Now, in order to find this out, I have to call, uh, or I have to define this point. Let's take another color. Well, let's take red. Uh, I have to call this point J omega, and this would be then minus J omega. Because I don't know at which frequency or J omega value this root locus passes the J omega axis. So, Based on the fact that uh, we have to satisfy the angle condition, I need to calculate basically j omega. So the first step is to find j omega. In other words, by the way, I'm trying to find the j omega root of the closed loop uh, characteristic polynomial, but we will come to that. So here, we will have the distance omega here. So let me again quickly copy this here. Let me get rid of these. We don't also need that. So, and let's have this here. 
So, this is 90 degrees, this is omega, this is 2, this is 3 here. So, uh, I can do the following. I know that this is 90 degrees, this is theta 0, this is minus 2, and this is minus 5. So, I can uh, use this triangle here, and if I look, for example, at the tangent theta minus 2, this is omega divided by 2. And the tangent of minus 5 is equal to omega divided by 5. So, um, here in this equation, here in this equation, I know that the sum of the angles should be equal to 180 degrees. Therefore, what I need to do is I need to look for this value here and this value here. So I need the inverse tangent or a tan. So let's plug it in. A tan of omega divided by 2 plus a tan omega divided by 5 should be equal to 180 degrees. Now again, luckily, I have already 90 degrees and 180 degrees in this equation. So what I really have to do is take the a tan of omega divided by 2 plus the a tan of omega divided by 5 should be equal to 90 degrees. So now, let me draw the following. Let's call this alpha. Let's call this alpha and this one beta. So in that case, let's draw a triangle. This is alpha. I've chosen that to be alpha and this is 90 degrees. So let's use one of uh, one of the unknowns here. Let's choose alpha for example. What I've written down is the following. A tan omega divided by 2 is equal to alpha. Therefore, omega divided by 2 is tangent alpha. Now, in this triangle, I can look for the tangent and I can write this the following down. Tangent alpha means that this is omega and this is 2. Now, if I use beta here, we have a tan omega divided by 5 equals beta. Therefore, tangent of beta should be equal to omega divided by 5. So now, uh, if I look at the triangle, I can also see that the tangent beta here is also, from the triangle, is also 2 divided by omega, because this one divided by this one. So therefore, these are equal, so we get the following. Now, this is equal to the following. Omega squared is equal to 10. I can conclude from here that omega is square root of 10, j. Actually, j omega is equal to square root 10, j. So, this is important. Let us... So this is an important result because we've used the angle condition in order to calculate what j omega is. Now we know the value of this. So therefore, let me again copy this. So now instead of writing j omega, I know that this point is j square root of 10 and minus j square root of 10. Now we've utilized the angle condition here in order to get the point where the j omega passing occurs. Now we need to use the 
gain condition of the root locus in order to calculate the p-type controller that results in this point. So the gain condition, by the way, is the following. Gain condition. Now for the gain condition, what we have to do is we have to, let me choose this one here. No, this is not a good choice. So let's call this L minus five. L2 and L0. Now, according to the gain condition, K is equal to L minus 5, L minus 2, and L0. So the distance from minus 5 to the point, from minus 2 to the point, and from 0 to the point is defined as L minus 5, L minus 2, and L0. Zero. So the multiplication of the distances should give me k. If I would have had any zero, then I would divide into the, uh, let's say, zero, one. If I have z1, a zero at z1, then I need to divide the distance of the zero to the design point. Since I don't have any zero, I'm going to omit that. So, now since I know the uh, distance or the design point, the coordinate of the design point, what I can do is I can do the following. Let me again uh, copy this part here. So now we don't need these. There we go. Now, if I look uh, close, I can see that I already know the coordinate of, uh, or the distance of L0. This is already equal to square root of 10. Um, for L2, I can calculate it, because this is uh, 2, this is 3, I need to take the square of 2, square root, square root of uh, 10, or let's call this omega, by the way, and then plug in j, uh, omega equals square root of 10. So the we can actually work out the distances here. So L0 is equal to omega. It's actually the absolute difference here. Uh, L minus 2 is the square of 2 plus square root of omega, and then the square root. For L minus 5, we have the distance 5 here, 5 squared, omega squared, and a square root here. So, K is equal to omega times, let's uh, use this, 4 uh, plus omega squared times 25 plus omega squared, square root. Now, uh, k is equal to square root of 10 times the square of omega is uh, 10, so 14 and 35. Of course, we can also see the following square root of 5, square root of 2, square root of 2, square root of 7, square root of 5, square root of 7. So these make 7. Then we have 5 and 2. 2 times 5 times 7. So, 70. Now, we have calculated a gain, but since we've calculated this gain, 70, we need to check if this is actually working. Now, let me go up again. Now, the system was looking like uh, 100 divided by S, S plus 2. 2 and s plus 5. Let me copy this again. And let's see for gs equals this what the closed loop looks like. Now 100 divided by 
s times. By the way, we can also calculate this. So this is s squared plus 7s plus 10 times s would give me s cubed plus 7s squared plus 10s. So this times k and then divided by 1 plus this one here. So, now we can see that, let me get to this point here, Ts is equal to, so 100k divided by s cube plus 7s squared plus 10s plus 100k is the closed loop transfer function. Now I'm multiplying with this term here, so therefore this is the closed loop. Now if we look for the characteristic polynomial s cubed plus 7s squared plus 10s plus 100k equals zero. This is uh, basically the characteristic polynomial of the closed loop. Now, uh, if we want to put this in the root locus uh, equation format, what we can do is we can divide by the non-k term here. So I'm using basically this here. So if I divide into this term, I'll get one plus 100k divided by s cubed plus 7s squared plus 10s equals 0. Now, of course, this is also obvious because this was 1 plus k times gs equals 0. But here, this term is important. 100k, or here, 100k is important because if we use the root locus gain condition and calculate a certain k value, it will correspond to this 100k here. Because we have a system, uh, the open loop gain, times the gain of the controller. They together should be equal to 70. So, as a good practice, what you can do is you can look for this uh, format here, which one, uh, it doesn't matter which one you prefer, you can choose the first one or the second one here. So choose one of these formats and look for the gain value here, 100k. So this should be the left hand side here. We've left this out, but 100k should be equal to the result here. So k is actually 0 0.7 and not 70. Because if I use 0.7, this value here will be 70. And the roots of s cubed plus 7s squared plus 10s plus 70 has this in it. This times something else. Because it's a third order system. So this is important. You have to check your k value and if it's working or not. We can also find what p is, but that's not the point here. It should be uh, equal to s squared plus 10 times s plus p, because two of the roots should be at square root 10, j square root of 10. Now, if you uh, choose 70 for k, then this will become 7000, and I don't think that the roots will have plus minus j square root of 10. You can check this using MATLAB, but I'm not going to uh, go into further detail here. But we've calculated k, and we should be aware of the fact that the left-hand side of the gain condition should be this term here. So therefore, this should be 70, therefore k is 0.7. Now, according to these, we found actually the stability interval, namely 0, k, 0.7. This is the end result. Now, this is not the only way of calculating the... the uh, uh, interval here. This was actually method one. So let's go up here. So this was basically I. 
What else can we do? Now, this is a long uh, solution here, as you can see. You have to utilize the root locus here. So you can see I've quite of I've wasted quite of a uh, number of pages here. But maybe we might look at some other um, methods. For example, we again have to calculate this here. Let's copy this. Let's paste this. So we can calculate the closed loop, the resulting closed loop here. What we also can do is the following. Since we have this polynomial and we are checking for the stability of this polynomial, of the characteristic polynomial here, we can also use the root table method. So we can also write down the root table. So s cube, s squared, s to the power of 1 and 0. Now, s cube is equal to 1. Maybe I'll change that. There we go. This is 1. And then we have 7 here. And then we have 10 here and 100k. So now I need to calculate this point here. And uh, you can do this uh, numerous ways. But one method would be to take the minus determinant of this, divide it by 7, this term here, or this term here. Um, and this would give you 100k minus 70, and then there's another minus sign, divided by 7, or 70 minus 100k divided by 7. So this is basically this term here, x, and then this is x. And since this is 0, this is 100k. You can again uh, calculate this using these two rows here, but you don't really have to, uh, because you will end up in the same result. So, now from here, since the first two values here are positive, then... For stability, x should be positive and 100k should be positive. Now from here I can conclude that k needs to be a positive value. And from x I can see this should be positive because divide by 7 is still positive. This will give me 70 and 100k. So k should be less than 0.7. If I combine them, I can see this is the stability interval. Of course, this seems to be simpler, and in terms of uh, calculations, it is. But I wanted to point out how to use root locus in order to um, get the actual data, and I wanted to show and uh, uh, calculate how uh, we can use the root locus. Normally, we use the MATLAB code rlocus and click on it, but we can also do this manually. So, by the way, if we choose k0, it will not end up in a, in a special root table because the, uh, let me copy this here again. Um, here, let's make, paste it here. So if we take k equals 0, then this term will be 0. And if I plug in k equals 0 into x here, 70 minus here, uh, 70 minus 100k divided by 70 would give me 10. Now, this is not a special case, but I can see that one of the poles uh, seem to be problematic. In fact, this is basically s cubed plus 7s squared plus 10s. So I know that one of the roots is already at zero. So this is not really a special case, but the following might end up in a, a special case. Namely, I will check it for k equals uh, 0.7. So 
this was for k equals 0. This is going to be k equals 0.7. Now, now, if I plug in k equals 0.7, here 100k will become 70. And of course, this is uh, the exact point where x is equal to 0. So this will become 0. Now, we have a 0 row here. There we go. Therefore, we can form the auxiliary polynomial. By the way, I might also change this to uh, 70. By the way, this should be equal to 0. There we go. Now here, I can form the auxiliary polynomial, which will be uh, formed based on the uh, top row here. 7s squared plus 70 equals 0. Now, normally you take the derivative and look for the sign change, etc. But I'm going to focus on the following. You can see that one of the roots or both of the roots are at square root of 10, which was again the value that we came up in the root locus here, namely this one here. So you can see that the methods kind of give the same results. We can use the root table, we can still see where the j omega crossing happens, and we can use the root locus plot, which is in, which gives us more detail about the crossing, but again, it gives us basically the same data. Now, again, this is not the only solution. I'm going to show you another one. There we go. Now, we can use the root table, we can use root locus, or we can also use the fact that, which I've already mentioned, that the closed loop should have the following uh, term in it, or two roots should be at j omega, uh, plus or minus j omega, s plus p. So, um, I can use one of the roots s equals square root of 10 or j omega here and since this characteristic polynomial should satisfy its roots in the closed loop uh, and since I know one of the roots should be equal to j omega I can use the following the characteristic polynomial s cube plus 7s squared plus 10s plus 100k, this should satisfy s equals j omega. And if it's satisfying this root, then this should be equal to 0. Now let's plug in j omega, the cube of j omega plus 7j omega squared plus 10j omega plus 100k should be equal to 0. Now at this point I can see that the left hand side is a complex number or complex valued function. Now in this particular case I don't only write 0 but since this is not a real valued 0, this is a complex 0, I have also j0 here. Or in other terms, I should equate the real part of the left-hand side to zero and the imaginary part uh, to zero. So, now this becomes j omega cubed minus 7 omega squared plus 10 j omega plus 100 k equals zero plus j zero. Now we have the imaginary terms here. Let's group them. So 100k minus 7 omega squared is the real part plus j. And then we have 10 omega minus omega cubed should be equal to 0 plus 0j. 100k minus 7 omega squared should be equal to 0. And 10 omega minus omega cubed should also be equal to 0. 
Now I can already see that omega times 10 minus omega squared should be equal to zero, and this gives me two solutions. One of them is omega equals zero, the other one is omega equals one j uh, squared of 10 plus minus j squared of 10, or omega squared is equal to 10. So this is interesting because if you think about it, the uh, j omega, if omega is zero, is the origin itself, because we assumed that s equals j omega, so this is j zero, or s equals zero plus j zero, which is basically the origin. So, <coughs> so using this method, we end up uh, finding the uh, passing through the origin, and we see that that uh, is also included in this solution. Here, the second solution corresponds to the solution that we were looking for. Now we can use these omega values in order to calculate the corresponding gains, because we have another equation here, and the equation uh, uses omega and k. If we know omega, which we do, uh, we can find out what k looks like. So for omega equals 0, using this equation here, I can see that k is equal to 0. And from this equation, that k is 0. Now, I've found out what the uh, interval is, but also we found out that the lower bound is 0 and the upper bound is 0.7 by just plugging in j omega into the characteristic polynomial. So this is kind of a neat example because this is the simplest and fastest and the most inclusive uh, method since uh, we can directly conclude the, the uh, intervals. Or if you're good with a root table, that's even faster, I guess, because you're just uh, using uh, just one determinant calculation and you're almost there. Now, if the order increases, both methods will be a little bit more painful because the higher the order, the uh, complex the equations will become. But nonetheless, it is uh, what it is. So we cannot uh, have uh, simpler solutions for complex um, equations or problems. So this is basically part one where we looked at the p-type controller and um, we looked at the stability interval of the p-type controller for such a given transfer function. So let's continue with uh, B, where we actually design a p-type controller. So let's go, go on and try to design a p-type controller. So, B. Now, the uh, requirements are a bit different than uh, usual because I wanted to point out what the peak time looks like or what the rise time looks like. So we have rise time 1.178 seconds and peak time 1.57 seconds. So, um, if you don't remember the uh, formulas for these, this is a good uh, occasion to remind you. So, let's start with the peak time here. Now the peak time, the definition of peak time, or the formula of peak time, is given as P divided by omega D. Now, of course, this is the peak value, the time instance where the peak value is observed in the transients is the peak time. So that's also the definition. Now, um, we have P divided by omega D. Before I go on, let me also give you the rise time. The rise time is somewhat similar. P minus beta divided by omega D. So there is basically a difference of beta divided by omega d. So what is omega d? Well, basically, omega is frequency and d is for damped. So this is the damped frequency. So let me give you um, 
let me give you the definition of zeta and omega n and omega d. So, let's have a circle. There we go. And let's have the origin. So, this is sigma, this is j omega. We're on the s domain again. Now, let me also choose another uh, color here. Let's assume that this is zeta here. And let's choose this point, this exact point here. Now, the radius of the circle is omega n, the natural frequency. This is the origin. Now, um, the uh, the uh, value for this line here is also zeta. Now, in this case, we've named this here beta, by the way. So, if you're asking yourself what beta is, this is basically beta here. It's the angle of the zeta line. Now, um, for a uh, polynomial, for the desired polynomial that we use all the time, s squared plus 2 times zeta omega n s plus omega n squared, we know that the solution to this uh, desired polynomial, s1 and 2, is equal to minus zeta omega n plus minus j zeta uh, 1 minus zeta squared omega n. Now here we can use this as uh, sigma here and this as j omega d. So basically this is the real part, sigma is the real part of the solution and the imaginary part is the damped frequency. Now here in the formula when you see omega d it's actually 1 minus zeta squared times omega n. And if you see beta, then you can work out what beta looks like. So, if we look for the coordinates of this position, we can see that this is omega d and this is sigma. So, let me draw you, by the way, the triangle. Here, this is beta. This is sigma, or in other words, omega, uh, zeta omega n. And since this is the radius, this is omega n. And then we also have 1 minus zeta squared omega n, the square root here. And this is 90 degrees. So, if we want to uh, define what beta is, or if we want to find the angle beta here, what we can do is we can use the tangent, or we can use the cosine. Both will work. So, for example, tangent beta here is equal to 1 minus zeta squared square root omega n divided by zeta omega n, where these vanish and we have this. Tangent beta is basically 1 minus zeta squared uh, square root divided by zeta. Or uh, a much simpler approach is to look for the cosine. What is the cosine of Beta. It is zeta omega n divided by omega n. Therefore, the cosine beta is actually zeta itself. So, if we look for um, transient behavior and if we try to set the settling time, overshoot, rise time, peak time, etc., then what we try to figure out is the zeta or uh, and omega n values or we're trying to look for sigma and omega d. Now this is basically sigma plus uh, or minus j omega d is the Cartesian coordinates of the solution and zeta and omega n are the polar coordinates of the solution. So they are basically the same and we can transition from one to another using these relations that I've uh, stated here. Now, um, here we have uh, p divided by omega d, and we know what the peak time is. 
and we know what the rise time is. So we can uh, find out what beta and omega d should be. If we know what beta and omega d are, we can use these relations here in order to come up with zeta and omega n in the practical sense that we use most of the time. So let's begin with peak time. So peak time p divided by omega d. Now this uh, can be used to or this is converted into p divided by t peak since we know what p is and since the peak time value was 1.57 uh, of course, uh, in order to be uh, more correct, I should have given it like p divided by 2, but that would be too obvious. So this is basically uh, approximately pi and pi, so it would be 1.99 something, so we can use it as 2 for the sake of the simplicity. So we have found out that omega d is 2. So that's one. Now in the rise time formula, we have P minus beta divided by omega D. So here we know what omega D looks like and we know the value of the rise time. So in order to find out what beta looks like, we can do the following omega D times T rise. Um, I guess P minus should be the correct way. Now, is this correct? Um, P minus beta, omega D, T rise time, yep. So this is basically the formula, but you don't really have to uh, work out what the formula is. Now, if we plug in omega D equals two and the rise time one, seven, eight, if you multiply them and then look for the subtraction here, we will end up in 0 0.7856 radians. Now at this point we have to be careful because this is in radians. Now if we use P as 3.14, for example, then this would be the result. If we want to convert this into degrees, we can easily do that by multiplying with 180 degrees, dividing by 3.14, and we will get 45 degrees. Now, numerically, uh, I'm not really sure if this is numerically correct now, but I was trying to choose the values such that the results or the numerical values are simple. But you don't uh, really have to uh, round the errors. Uh, so therefore, use the exact values if you're in, in an exam, but here for the sake of simplicity, I'm not caring about numerical correctness. So, um, we have beta. Now, uh, we have omega d. Now we can use, if, you're, uh, if you want to use tangent beta, you can do that, but it is simpler to use cosine. So, here, since we have the angle here, we can use cosine beta. That would be uh, cosine 45 degrees. So therefore, this would be square root 2 divided by 2. Because this is a known value. Um, since omega d is defined as 1 minus zeta squared times omega n equals 2, we can also plug in zeta in here and find out what omega n is. And omega n is 2 square root of 2, or roughly 2.83 radians per second. Now, of course, we've chosen the, uh, the peak time and rise time here in order to uh, remind you and show you the formulas again of peak time and rise time. But any uh, transient uh, requirement 
if you have two of them, should give you omega n and zeta. For example, you can use settling time and overshoot instead of peak time and rise time, and you can also end up in omega n and zeta values. That's uh, actually what we are looking for. Now, I've talked about the, the fact that omega n and zeta are the polar coordinates, so what is the actual Cartesian coordinates of the solution? Now, if you uh, calculate sigma, which is omega n times zeta here, you can see that it is basically 2. So the solution here is minus 2 plus or minus j, and omega d was again 2, 2. So this is the solution in Cartesian coordinates, and it corresponds to omega n being 2.83 and zeta being square root 2 divided by 2. Now, this is the pre-processing um, step here. We need to work out what the uh, dominant poles should look like. I say dominant poles because our system is a third order system and we are trying to design a p-type controller. Therefore, therefore, two of the poles will be assigned so that we have dominant poles. But the third pole, hopefully, should be far on the left and out of the dominant region in order to be able to use the peak time rise time formulas in this example. So, therefore we have to look for uh, dominance, but before that we need to come up with a p-type controller. Now we're at the point where we know what the um, poles should look like, so we can again use multiple methods and I'm going to use root locus again to show you how to use root locus for this design problem here. So let me again copy this root locus here. rid of the unnecessary stuff. There we go. Now, this time, if you remember, we were looking for this point for stability. This time, that's not the case. This time, we know that uh, we have the position here, which is minus 2 and yeah, my, my sketch is not really the best here, but uh, minus 2 and 2, which looks like this point. Now, according to the sketch, it seems like this is not on the root locus plot, but since I'm not a, a good sketcher here, maybe we should look for the angle condition, because I've told you in the stability step using the root locus that... If it's on the root locus, it should satisfy the angle condition. But in this case, the position is shifted. So, let me change the color here. So, we have to draw each... Uh, we have to draw the vectors from each pole to this point. And then we need to look for the angles here. Let me call this again zero. This is 90 degrees, I might directly use that, and this is theta minus 5. So I can, uh, or I need to, look for the following. The angle condition, so I need to use the angle condition, which was the following. 0 and at minus 5 plus uh, minus 2 minus 5 should be equal to 180 degrees. Now, I again know one of the angles, namely this one here in this case, is 90 degrees. So, and by the way, uh, this time I know that, uh, let me maybe copy again, I know the, uh, so let me copy this,
so. In the stability example, um, we didn't know what the coordinate is, but we know exactly the values in this uh, case. This is 2 and this is 3. So uh, the only thing that's left to us is to look up the angles. Now, in this case, again, we can use a tangent theta minus 5 equals 2 divided by 3, or we can directly use a tan here. So a tan uh, 2 divided by 3 is this angle here. We have the 90 degrees angle in this case. And again, we need to look for this angle here. But since this is a simple one, this is 45 degrees because 2, 2, 10 equals 1. This would be 135 degrees. So if we plug these in to the angle condition, we can see that here theta 0 was 135 degrees plus 90 degrees plus a tan 2 divided by 3. Is this equal to 180 degrees? Because it should be. Now, if we look up the exact values, uh, we see that this is 33.69 degrees. Therefore, um, therefore, we see that the left-hand side is 258.69 degrees and 180 degrees. Therefore, the angle condition is not satisfied. It is greater than 180 degrees, which was basically obvious with the first two terms here, but still... Um, now, it seems like uh, my sketch was not that bad because we've seen that, according to the sketch, this point is not on the root locus. And in fact, it is not on the root locus. Now, it's op uh, of course obvious that these will end up in here and the branch will go uh, uh, and tend to the asymptote here. Therefore, it was certain at this point because this asymptote here uh, will prevent this branch from uh, going through this design point here. So, we can see, using the root locus, we can conclude that we are not able to design a p-type controller that has the exact rise time and peak time values that we are asked for. So, it is not possible to come up with a p-type controller that has 1.57 seconds of peak time and 1.178 seconds of rise time. Now, again, this is not the only way where we can see if we can satisfy this point or not. We can look for another method. And let's try that. Now, again, maybe you don't want to use the root locus uh, here. So where is it? It's basically here. So I. You can also use the algebraic method. So. We know that the characteristic polynomial for a p-type controller is this. And we also know that the poles are at 2 plus minus j2. So basically my solution should include these roots here in the close. Now this is s squared plus... 4s plus 8. So I need to use this because this is PDS, this is PCS, the characteristic polynomial, the desired polynomial, and in this case, since this is a third order polynomial, I also need a RISD polynomial, PES. So now what I can do is I can do the following S cube plus 7s squared plus 10s plus k should be equal to. Now, we have s cubed plus ps squared plus 4s squared plus 4ps plus 8s plus 8p. Now, if we combine the terms, s cubed plus 
PS squared, 4S squared, P plus 4S squared, plus 4PS plus 8, 4P plus 8S, and then 8P. Now, here we can see that the S cube terms are uh, equal to each other. So therefore, 7 should be equal to P plus 4, and 10 should be equal to 4P plus 8, and K should be equal to 8P. Now, if we look at this design problem, I didn't write down 1 equals 1, but it's not really that important. This is a trivial uh, equation here. Now, from this set of equations, I can see that we have three equations, and we have only two variables. Now, interestingly, there's only one possibility where I can have a solution, and that is that one of, uh, two of the uh, equations in this set of equations should be basically aligned or should uh, be reduced down to the same equation. So it should lose rank in this case. If this is a, you can put it in a mat matrix format and it should lose rank. Now, let's see if it's the case. Now, if I use the first equation, according to the first equation here, P is equal to 3. Now, if P is equal to 3, the equation becomes the following. The set of equations becomes the following. 7 equals 7, 10 equals uh, 20, and K equals 24. Now, if I use the second equation, this one this time, then... Uh, 10 minus 8 divided by 4, 2 divided by 4, p is equal to 0.5. Now, if that's the case, the set of equations would look like 7 equals 4.5, 10 equals 10, and k equals 4. Now, obviously, we cannot satisfy the set of equations because here we have a false identity, here we have another false identity. So therefore, we cannot come up with a p-type controller that satisfies this set of equations. Therefore, there is no solution. Now we've seen that for a p-type controller design problem, it doesn't matter which method you use, you can use the algebraic method and you can see that there, there is an empty solution or you cannot design a p-type controller that satisfies the given requirements. Or you can use the root locus method and see that the angle condition is not satisfied, therefore we are not able to choose that point uh, because it's not on the root locus. So, this was basically B. Now up to this point, we have solved A, we have solved B. Now, the root locus plot here, uh, or even the algebraic method here, can help you in choosing a controller that might be a solution to this problem. So, in the laboratory sessions previously, I've talked about the fact that if you're not able to design a controller or if you're not able to meet the requirements, there are two possible ways to overcome this problem. One of them is to loosen your uh, requirements. For example, you might ch choose different rise time or peak time combinations that are not that uh, f forcing for your solution. Uh, by slowing down the requirements, you might end up in a p-type controller. Because if you look up uh, uh, the root locus, if you look on the following, where is it? The problem here is basically the fact that the root locus does not go through this point. But if this point would have been on the right, then we would have maybe been able to come up with a p-type controller. And in order to shift this point to the right, we have to slow down things. For example, if this is a settling time requirement, then 
by having a higher settling time value, we might end up on the right, we might shift this to the right, therefore, we might be able to come up with a controller for a p-type controller. So therefore, uh, this is one way of uh, attacking the problem here, and it is also a possibility to come up with a different controller structure, because the p-type controller can only um, affect the constant term here, this one here. So if we have a um, more complex controller, because this is just a game, if we have uh, additional structure to it, we might end up in affecting the s term or the s square terms here. And that would solve the problem because we need another, uh, another variable here. If this would have been a three equation, three variable uh, kind of set of equation, uh, then we would have been able to solve this problem. So uh, here, if we have another, for example, unknown here, let's say x, then this uh, set of equations will have a solution. So therefore, we need to look for a controller that might end up in the peak time and rise time requirements that are given here. So let's start with the root locus here. And from the angle condition, where is it? So this was stability, this was that, and here we had the angle condition. So let me copy this part here. So now we are looking for C here. Now, Now let's focus on the angle condition. Here, the problem is that we have a value of 258 degrees, which is too much. Now, if you remember, the uh, formula for the angle condition was, let me show you, is it somewhere here? Did we wrote it down like that? Yeah, here. Uh, actually, this was not for the angle condition, but the angle condition is also similar. Yeah, we didn't write it down, so let me show you. So, here. Now, uh, the angle condition is actually finite the angle so let me write it nicely the angle of finite poles minus the angle of finite zeros should equal to 180 degrees. Since we didn't have any zeros, we omitted the second part here, and we only used the uh, sum of the angles of the poles. Now, since this is a higher value, this is a greater value than 180 degrees, we need a negative effect on the angle condition uh, in order to uh, satisfy the angle condition. Once we've satisfied that, we can then come up with a controller. So, basically, what I'm trying to tell you here is that we need to add a zero to the system in order to uh, have a negative theta so we are looking for 69 should equal to 180 degrees. So of course we can also directly calculate what the angle should be. And it should be 78.69 degrees. If we add a zero that has this angle here, then the equation will be satisfied. So therefore, Let's uh, try to work out where the zero should be. Now, um, note that 
let me choose the color here. Note that theta zero here is a wide angle. And here we have uh, the 90 degrees here. So therefore, it seems like my zero that I'm trying to add here should be somewhere here. Maybe I should change the color here. The zero should be here. And I then draw a line from this zero here. And this angle should be the given angle 78.69 degrees. So since I know that we have the value 2 here, but I don't know what the distance here is, let me draw another triangle. This is 2, this is d, and this is the theta angle here. So I can basically use again the tangent. So tangent of 78, 69 degrees is equal to 2 divided by d. So therefore d would be 2 divided by tangent 78.69 degrees. Now, if we work this out, if we plug in the values, we will get 0 0.4, 0 0.4. So since this is the distance here, here we have only the distance, and this is minus 2, then, let me write minus c, um, then the actual location would be 2.4. Now, this is interesting because now I'm claiming that adding a 0 at minus 2.4 at this location here will satisfy the uh, angle condition. Of course now the root locus will not look like this. Um, the root locus will be altered a little bit. So hope that I can oh hope that I can sketch the root locus. Now the asymptote angles also change by the way. So let's get rid of the angle conditions here. So there we go. So now the root locus will change. And now the asymptote angles are 90 degrees and minus 90 degrees. And you can also work out where the asymptote uh, uh, intersection point will be. But now our root locus will look like the following. Hope that I can sketch it good. Now again, these will approach each other. But this time, this will approach the zero here. So that's one. And um, that's the tricky part here. Mm. So there we go. Yeah, that's not the best sketch, but let me try it again. Mm, nope. Something like this. So also the symmetric one. So yeah, pardon me for my uh, bad sketching skills, but hope that you get the idea. Now, um, uh, previously the uh, root locus plot was looking like this. Now we've added a zero that manipulates the root locus and forces it to go through the red point that is given here. And this was uh, because of the effect of the zero. It changed the asymptote angles, the intersection of the asymptotes, and it bended the root locus as shown here. 
Now we are on the root locus. At this point, we can use the gain condition in order to calculate in order to calculate the k value because now we are not basically looking at the root locus of gs, but we are looking at the root locus of s plus 2.4 gs. Because we have added a zero. Now we are trying to design a p-type controller for an altered system, which has a zero now. Now this is the root locus of this, and we are looking for k. Still we are somehow designing a p-type controller, but we've already decided on the zero. Now, since we are satisfying the angle condition, now we we'll have to look for the gain condition. And again, remember, the left-hand side for the gain condition was 100k. That, that, that doesn't change here. And now, the gain condition is the following. L0 times L minus 2 times L minus 5 divided by L minus 2.4. Now I have to divide into the distance of the zero in order to uh, use the gain condition here. Now, um, actually we know what the um, uh, L minus 2.4 looks like because we had this triangle and it was, this point was the design point here. Therefore, we already have a nice triangle that represents the distance from the zero from the zero to the uh, actual design point here. So, 100k will be equal to the following. So, the um, at zero, at zero, let me again change color here. We have these. This one. And this one here. So this is L0, this is L minus 2, this is L minus 5, and this is L minus 2.4. Now uh, I'm going to write these down. It would be, no, let's change color. 2 squared plus 2 squared square root for 0 here. For minus 2, I guess that's the simplest one. It is directly 2. So I can use directly 2 here. And for minus 5, I have here, we have 3 and then 2, the square of 3 and 2, square root, divided by, two squared plus 0.4 squared square root. So from here, we can find out that 100k is equal to 20.3961 divided by 2.03961. So therefore, K <coughs> is calculated as 0.1. And we know that the value was 2.4 here. Therefore, our controller should be in this format. And therefore, fs is equal to 0 0.1 times s plus 2.4. Or in other words, one point, uh, 0 0.1s plus 0.24. This being kd, this being kp. There we go, we have designed or we have decided that we need a PD type controller. Now in the questions here, we uh, already gave you the fact that we need a PD type controller, but even if uh, the type of controller is not mentioned, you can use the root locus method in order to determine what the controller should be. Namely, we need to reduce the angle here on the left-hand side in order to satisfy the angle condition of the root locus. Therefore, we need a negative effect, and this negative effect can only be satisfied with a zero. Not only, but can be satisfied with a zero. So let's add a zero um, in order to 
at the zero, we know that we have to make a 78.69 degrees difference in order to satisfy this equation. Therefore, the zero should set, uh, satisfy this angle. Therefore, we've constructed the triangle that shows us what the position of the zero should be. We have worked this out. We find out, found out that uh, the zero should be at minus 2.4. At that point, we uh, have manipulated the root locus so that, even if I'm uh, sketching it bad, so that the point, the design point that we are interested in is on the root locus plot now. Of course, we have added a zero to the system. Therefore, we are looking in an updated, altered root locus plot. Then, at this point, the only thing that was left was to determine which k value will give us the um, given design point here. Therefore, we have concluded that the uh, we've used the gain uh, condition here, and we've concluded the fact that we need a PD type controller, and if we're choosing a PD type controller, the KD value should be 0.1 and the KP value should be 0.24. Now, again, this is not the only way of solving this problem. It might be a bit harder to see using the algebraic method in order to come up with a controller that suits you, but we know that we have s cubed plus 7s squared plus 10s plus k. Now, at this point, we have to have an effect on the s term because previously we've seen that here... I guess here, mm, yeah, we've seen that uh, here, if we, for example, choose uh, 7 equals p plus 4, then we have to affect this 10s term here. So we have to update our um, controller that will give us the desired effect. Now, we know that gs equals... 100 divided by this, and we are looking for a controller. Now, um, let me remind you that NF divided by DFS. Now, the characteristic polynomial is formed like the following. 100 NFS plus S cubed plus 7S squared plus 10S DFS. You can work this out. You can just use... Uh, just use the fact that we have fs gs divided by 1 plus fs gs you can see that this holds now here uh, let's not touch dfs let's say that this is equal to 1 then uh, and if i choose a pd controller for example if i choose nfs equals kds plus kp i'll see the following 100 times kds plus 100 times kp plus s cube plus 7s squared plus 10s will be the characteristic polynomial now let me rearrange the terms here s cube plus 7s squared that's not touched plus 10s we have also 100 KDS, so 10 plus 100 KD times S plus uh, 100 KP. So that's it. Now our um, desired polynomial was, let me copy that too, was this. There we go. Now we can see S cubes are the same. This should be equal to this. And this term should be equal to this. And the left term, this one should be this. So therefore, P plus four equals 7, 10 plus 100 KD equals 4P plus 8, and 100 KP should be equal to 8P.
Now, if we count the variables here, we have, of course, we have 1 equals 1, but I didn't write it down. We have P, KD, and KP, three variables, and three equations. Therefore, we can solve this set of equations. It has a unique solution. And we can see, for example, that P is equal to 3. That's uh, one thing. And then 10 plus 100 KD is equal to 24. Uh, no, it's not equal to 24. It's uh, equal to 20. I'm sorry. So let's subtract 10. Then it should be equal to 10 divided by 100 gives us KD equals 0.1. Now let's solve the last one here. 100 KP should be equal to 24. KP is equal to 0.24. So as I've mentioned before, it might be not that easy to look at this equation here and conclude that you need a PD type controller but uh, if you're not uh, if you don't succeed in designing a P type controller the next best thing is to design a PD type controller you might uh, take a blind guess or you might look at the angle condition and see what your angle contribution should be now uh, we have also seen that we have a pole at uh, 3 or minus 3 in this case. So now let's again look for the root locus here and we can by the way see, let me copy this again or let's uh, draw it from scratch. So I want to look at the pole 0 uh, locations in the closed loop. So. So, um, in the root locus, in the open loop, we had at the origin, at minus 2, minus 5, and that was it. Now, we have designed a controller, and we've chosen a zero somewhere here, and our design point was to... Oh god, I have to... Yeah. Um, something like this. So uh, we have chosen a design point that looks like this. So we have poles here. Maybe I should again change color. So we have a pole here and then also here. And one should be at minus three. And we have a zero that is here. Now, in terms of dominant pole placements, we know that this is 2.4, this is minus 3, and here we have a coordinate of t, 2j. Now, in terms of dominant pole placements, we can see that the poles and zeros are close to each other, but they are still in the dominant region and they are not cancelling each other out. Therefore, in terms of dominant pole placements, this is not the best solution that we can come up with. But this is for now, for a PD type controller, the only solution that we can come up with. Therefore, this is uh, the only thing that we got available to us. Um, so, yeah, we've used two methods here in order to um, design a PD type controller. Therefore, we've also got rid of C here. Now, what about a PI type controller? What if we design a PI type controller? So, um, now I will not use or attack the problem from the root locus because you might uh, already uh, got the idea. So, let's try to use the algebraic method. By the way, let me also point out the fact that during the design of the PD type controller, I didn't choose the the root locus definition of the PD type controller, namely k times s plus z, 
If you're using the algebraic method, please avoid to use this. Instead, use KDS plus KP. Because it has uh, uh, a linear structure here, and using linear uh, structures uh, simplifies the task of designing a controller or solving a problem. Um, and if you're defining a residue polynomial, try again, uh, try to uh, come up with linear coefficients or just define the unknowns in terms of coefficients, not in terms of zeros or poles. So, after this quick advice, let's go on and try to design API type controller to this uh, system here. So for the PI controller, so was it C? Uh, I immediately forgot. So let me check again. D. So. D. PI type controller. Now again, I'm going to use the algebraic methods. Therefore, I'm going to define my controller as FS equals KP plus KI divided by S. I might also use the following definition, but I'm not going to. If you're not interested in the poles and zeros, then never ever go ahead and use this. Go and use uh, KP, KI and KD coefficients instead of poles and zeros for the algebraic method, of course. Now, this is the controller. This is the system. 100 divided by SQ plus 7S squared plus 10s. So let's calculate the closed loop. And let me also note that this is kps plus ki divided by s. Now you don't have to uh, do all the math in order to end up in the closed loop transfer function. You can just use the numerators of both 100 kp s plus ki divided by the multiplication of numerators again and the denominators so we have s and s cube plus all that stuff so i can write down s to the 4 plus 7 s cube plus 10 s squared plus and then the numerator here 100 kps plus 100 ki now, here I can rearrange some terms. Oh, I, I am already in the best position here. Okay. Now, remember that we were choosing PDS equals S squared plus 4S plus 8. There we go. Now we have a fourth order closed loop, which is uh, actually um, expected due to the fact that the system is a third order system, the controller is a first order system, uh, first order controller, the closed loop should be a fourth order transfer function. So that's, that was expected. Now at this point, we need to define the residue polynomial. Now the residue polynomial, by the way, can be defined in two ways. One of them being S plus P1, S plus P2, and that's it. Now, again, we're using the algebraic methods. We should not use this definition. We can, but a, an easier way would be to define this as AS plus B in terms of the coefficients of the polynomial. Because uh, here P1 and P2, P1 and P2 are complex numbers, positive complex numbers. Here in this case, A and B are positive real numbers. So there's a big difference in terms of uh, simplicity because uh, these will end up in complex conjugate poles, but here A and B are just uh, positive values and not complex. So therefore, In the notes, by the way, I have given you the bad example and I've shown you um, that it is really painful to work out 
uh, work with uh, poles and zeros in terms of definition. But here I will showcase the, the uh, ideal usage of uh, the unknowns here. So I have defined my controller in terms of Kp and Ki, and I have defined my raised polynomials in terms of coefficients. So I need to calculate the PDS, PES multiplication because that's the right hand side and left hand side will be the characteristic polynomial given above. So S to the 4 plus A S cubed plus B S squared plus 4 S cubed plus 4 A S squared plus 4 B S plus 8 S squared plus 8 A S plus 8B. So we have we have A S cube, 4 S cube, and that's it. And then we have B S squared, 4 A S squared, and 8 S squared. And we have 4 B S and 8 A S, and then the constant term. So a plus 4s cube plus um, 8 plus 4a plus b s squared plus 8a plus 4b s plus 8b. Now the problem here becomes the following a plus 4 should be equal to 7 and 8 plus 4a plus b should be equal to 10 and 8a plus 4b should be equal to 100 kp and 8b should be 100ki. Now from here, I can see that a is equal to 3. If a is equal to 3, this becomes 20 plus b equals 10. And from here, I can see that we have b equals minus 10. And if that's the case, then let me write it down. b equals minus 10. Now, at this point, I can stop because uh, I have negative 10 here. But let me uh, quickly try to calculate the kp and ki terms. a is 3, so 24, 4b minus 4t. So minus 16, so Kp should be equal to minus 0.16. And B is again minus 10, so therefore Ki should be minus 0.8, something like this. So why did I stop? Because of the fact that we have a negative 10 here. So A and B will determine the closed loop stability because we already have this part here, which is the dominant pole polynomial or which corresponds to the dominant poles. Now, this is by definition um, stable because if zeta is real and positive is omega n is real and positive then this will always be stable so I don't really have to check again if PDS is stable but even in this case I can see that I have numerical data and I have 1 4 and 8 I know what the roots are I already know that this is a stable polynomial and then I'm multiplying this with the rest of the polynomial here and this is equal to the characteristic polynomial. Now, even if I solve this set of equations and come up with Kp and Ki, 
I know from the beginning that they will have the roots of PDS and PES. So it is sufficient to check if S squared plus AS plus B is stable. And I can do this by looking at the coefficients. And if it's a higher order raised to polynomial, I might go ahead and check the root table. But for second order uh, polynomials, it's really easy to see that this is basically the root table. And if one is positive, since one is positive, A needs to be positive and B needs to be positive in order to end up in stable polynomials. If it's a third order, you can check the root table again. But for second order polynomials, I can safely assume that A should be positive and B should be positive. A was positive, which is a good thing, but then I can see that B is negative. And uh, from here, you can see that the sum of S1 plus S2 uh, is negative due to minus, minus A divided by 1, minus B divided by A. So this is negative, which is good, but the multiplication is b divided by 1, which is negative, which means that they change size, signs. So if, for example, s1 is positive, s2 is negative, or vice versa. So one of the poles should be on the right-hand side, one of them should be on the left. And then I have also my dominant ones. So three of the poles in the closed loop are on the left half plane, but one of them is on the right half plane. So therefore, the closed loop is already not stable. So I don't really have to continue on designing it. If I would have designed the controller, the controller uh, might look like minus 0.16 and then minus 0.8 divided by S, but the closed loop is not stable. Um, yeah, so therefore, I cannot design a PI controller that is stable in the closed loop. So therefore, uh, I cannot come up with a PI controller or I cannot design a PI controller. So, we have basically uh, solved D here. Now I'm going to talk about uh, E, which uh, wants a model matching design here, which is asking for a model matching design. So let's see what a model matching controller is. We didn't uh, cover this in the laboratory, but it's also fairly easy, so I might cover it here. And uh, since you are preparing yourself for an exam, it might be helpful. Now, usually when we design a controller, and let's also write down the system that we have, S times S plus two times S plus five. Now in the controller design, what we want to achieve is that we have some transients transient requirements. Um, for example, rise time and peak time. We convert this into zeta and omega n or sigma plus minus j omega d. And we have only two poles in this case that should be dominant because these, uh, this transition is only valid for second order all pole transfer functions. Therefore, we decide on two poles and try to design a controller that keeps all the uh, non-dominant poles and zeros away from the dominant ones. So that's it. Now, um, and we can form uh, a polynomial based on uh, zeta and omega n or uh, sigma and omega d that looks like this, for example, in our case, it is s squared plus 4s plus 8. This is the ideal transients that we uh, aim for. Now, 
And if this would have been the ideal case, then the closed loop, or since this is a closed loop, would look like, and I want to track some inputs, so therefore I need to use 8 in the numerator, because if I plug in s equals 0 for the final value theorem, I can see that the gain would be equal to 1. So therefore we would have reference tracking. Now, um, this would be, or this is the idea of the best closed loop transfer function that fits the rise time and peak time in this case. So, and if I'm attacking the problem from uh, choosing the structure of the controller and trying to achieve the, the best uh, closed loop that tends to the desired closed loop transfer function, then I'm basically deciding on the structure and try to accomplish this. But do we really have to um, choose the structure of the controller and try to keep all the uh, non-dominant poles and zeros away from the dominant ones? What if I take the controller transfer function, I don't define it, I take it, I look for the closed loop transfer function, namely fs times gs divided by 1 plus fs times gs. I want to uh, achieve this, but ideally I'd like to have tds equals this. Now, uh, I can also work my way out and try to get a, a formula for fs. So let's do that. Let's multiply these. tds plus tds times fs gs is equal to fs gs. And I want to find fs in here, so maybe tds equals fs gs minus tds fs gs. Here we have gs as a common term, so tds divided by gs, since this is a CISO system, I can easily do that, fs minus tds fs. Now we have fs as a common term, and this would look like tds divided by gs equals 1 minus tds times fs. Therefore, fs looks like this. tds divided by 1 minus tds times gs. So this is basically the controller that will give me the ideal case. I don't really care about the dominance factor because there is no dominance factor. Because this controller, if I use this controller in the closed loop, will end up in a second order transfer function that is exactly this. I don't really care about the unnecessary uh, stuff like dominant poles, dominant zeros, if it's on the root locus. I don't really care. Because no matter what the degree of the system is, first of all, this uh, is important because if we look close to the uh, definition here, I have the controller, I have something here times 1 divided by gs. So remember the root locus. If we plot the root locus, we have this loop transfer function here, with, which is fs times gs. Now, if I calculate this, the only thing that I'll see here is tds divided by 1 minus tds. So, there are no poles of the original open loop because we've cancelled them. The controller itself, no matter what this part is, places zeros at the poles of the open loop and poles at the uh, zeros of the open loop. 
So, for example, in our case, fs something like tds, I'm not going to write it for now, 1 minus tds times, let's take the inverse of our open loop transfer function. That would be s cubed plus 7s squared, or let me write it in this form here, divided by 100. This is the inverse. Now you can see that the controller has a 0 at the origin, a 0 at minus 2, and a 0 at minus 5. So there's a pole 0 cancellation here. If you've watched the week 5, uh, which I may have uploaded when I uh, have uploaded this video, then we design a PID controller using pole zero cancellation, but the most general form of that phenomena is called model matching controller. And the matching part here is exactly this term here, 1 divided by gs, because I have uh, zeros at poles of gs, and poles at zeros of gs. So if you remember from your lecture notes uh, or your lectures, there is something called uh, control with the inverse of the system. So that's basically what this part means. This is the inverse of the system and we are controlling uh, or we're including the inverse of the system. Of course, if this, uh, if this is going to be a practical uh, system, if we are going to design the controller according to the model matching controller, and if we are going to apply this controller, there's a problem due to the fact that we have a mathematical model for GS, and there's also the actual system GS. GS is just a representation, a mathematical definition of the system that you're trying to control. Therefore, if you have a model that's not exactly corresponding to the actual system, then you might end up in trouble. Because then your zeros and poles may not be exactly at the poles and zeros of the system. Then it's not an exact cancellation which might cause problems. Especially when you have a pole at the origin. So that's basically uh, the most uh, dangerous point where you want to have your pole zero cancellation. Now, what is the first part of the controller? Because TDS divided by 1 minus TDS is also something that we might already know. <coughs> now, we have TDS divided by 1 minus TDS. So what is this? Or... If I take it into a closed loop, what uh, will I find out? So let's have TDS divided by 1 minus TDS like this. There we go. So, if I calculate this, TDS, 1 minus TDS, divided by 1 plus TDS, 1 minus TDS. So, this is equal to TDS divided by, maybe I should, should go on like this, TDS divided by 1 minus TDS, plus TDS. So they cancel each other out and we have TDS. So what does this mean? Well, basically, instead of calling this TDS divided by 1 minus TDS, what I can do is I can say that this is LDS. So what does this mean? Basically, I have a loop transfer function, LS, and I am basically defining the ideal loop transfer function here. So if I have this ls in the closed loop, I'll end up in TDS. So an example is the best thing to provide here. So our TDS looks like 
um, 8 divided by s squared plus 4s plus 8. Now, if you calculate the loop transfer function of this, which is uh, TDS divided by 1 minus TDS, then you'll get the following. So 8 divided by s squared plus 4s plus 8 minus 8. Therefore, LDS is equal to 8 divided by s squared plus 4s. Or LDS is equal to 8 divided by s times s plus 4. So this means that in order to end up in this desired closed loop here, you have to have this in the loop transfer function. Or, from a root locus perspective, we should have one pole at the origin and one pole at minus 4. They will coincide at minus 2. And this will be the root locus that you're looking for. Because uh, we have the real part equals minus 2. Therefore, for 45 degrees, we'll meet at this point, and this will be our design point. And then we're basically choosing gain 8, I guess, because uh, this is 8. If you are pl uh, plotting the root locus, you might plot 1 as s plus 4, and if you ch choose the p-type controller 8, then you'll end up in the closed loop TDS 8 divided by s squared plus 4s plus 8. So, in terms of pole zero cancellation, what the controller does is it gets rid of all the poles and zeros of the open loop and then places one pole at the origin and one pole at minus four and chooses the gain eight in order to end up in your uh, closed loop desired transfer function. So therefore, our controller is eight divided by s times s plus four because we need this in the loop transfer function and then the inverse s times s plus 2 times s plus 5 divided by 100 in order to get rid of the whole system. This part here is the matching part. This part here is the meeting the requirements part. Therefore, we have the model matching controller. Of course, most of the time you'll use the formula that I've worked out here. And that'll give you the same. But in terms of commenting on it, I have tried my best to explain it to you. You have a loop transfer function that you want to have uh, from a root locus perspective. You need a pole at minus four, pole at the origin. They will meet up uh, at minus two. And then we will have this branch here and our design point here, which we were drawing with red, is here. Now, uh, uh, this is kind of a, a controller. By the way, in this controller, we can also see that this S here and this S here is canceled out. So we can, we can define the controller in a more compact form. We have eight divided by 100. And then we have s plus 2, s plus 5, divided by s plus 4. Now, this uh, would have been a PID controller if this was equal to s and not s plus 4. But it's not. It seems like it, but it is not. Um, you can think of this as a PD plus a first order transfer, uh, first order controller. Uh, that's basically it because one of this is the PD part and then this will be the first order part and that's basically it. So this is the model matching controller. So what about the next question here? What about phase lead controller? So that's basically our last um, part here because then uh, the comparison uh, is the only step that we need to uh, look at. So 
what about um, the face lead controller? So F face lead. Now, um, in order to design a face lead controller, let me define a first order controller that looks like this. K times S plus Z divided by S plus P. Now, this is a first order controller. It can be phase lead, it can be phase lag. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but what we essentially do with a first order controller is we add a zero to the system and a pole to the system. Now, if P is equal to zero, then we are designing a PI controller. Um, so let's try to design a phase lead controller or a first order controller. The only thing that we have to do is we have to um, we have to use the algebraic method. Let's use the algebraic method. The closed loop for the phase lead or first order uh, controller will look like this: hundred k plus s plus uh, times s plus z divided by s cubed plus 7s squared plus 10s plus, uh, uh, not plus, times s plus p plus 100ks plus 100kz. There we go. Now, the characteristic polynomial will be equal to s to the power of 4 plus s cube p plus 7s cube plus 7ps squared plus 10s squared plus 10ps plus 100ks plus 100kz. Now we have s to the power of 4 s cube and then s cube s squared s squared 10 ps 100 ks and the constant term so p plus 7 s cube plus um, 7 p plus 10 plus 10p plus 100k uh, s squared s and 100kz. Now, I did define a um, polynomial here. Let me grab this one. So there we go. Now from this, I'm going to state the design problem here. So P plus seven is equal to A plus four. Seven, seven P plus 10 is equal to four A plus B plus eight. 10 P plus 100 K is equal to 8a plus 4b and 100kz is equal to 8b. Now, we have four equations a, b, k, z and p. So basically five variables. So of course we don't have a unique solution, we have infinitely amount of solutions in this case. Now, what we can do is we can choose arbitrary values 
Uh, again, in week five, I'm mentioning this case. If we have infinite amount of solutions, we can use tabulation. But, uh, of course, that's not the only way of solving this. Now, let's try to come up with a, uh, with a solution here. Now, um, what happens if we take, um, so we have s squared plus as plus b, so I'm trying to come up with a and b values that are at least stable. Now, I guess if I, for example, take a equals 9 and b equals 8, this will correspond to um, this case here. So uh, if a is equal to 9, let's see if it works. If b is equal to 8, p would be the following. We would have 4 plus 9 minus 7. So p is equal to 6. Um, if p is equal to 6, this should hold basically. Uh, let's check that. 4 times 9 plus 8 plus 8. Is it equal to 42 plus 10? So 16, 52, 52, so it holds. There we go. Now we can use these two equations here. P was equal to 6, so 60 plus 100K is equal to 8 times 9, 72, plus 4 times that, 32. So is it 104? minus 60, 84, I guess k is equal to 0.84, if I'm not mistaken. Now we can also see that 84 z should be equal to 64, so z is then equal to, um, I guess, uh, this should be 44. I had some of a calculation mistake here. But that then turns out to be 1.45. Now, this is not really that important. I'm trying to work out the numerical part, the uh, numbers here. So note that I have chosen uh, A and B so that we have basically a stable closed loop because there are infinitely amount of solutions I have to at least choose a stable uh, solution here now the controller that we then end up in is the following we have FS where the gain is 0.44 the zero here is at 145 and the pole here is at 6 now let us try to depict what's really going on in the root locus domain or s domain here so we had a pole here a pole here and one here this is the origin so we added let me choose another color here let's have blue or let's have red now we added a zero somewhere here 145 and we added a pole here at minus 6 now uh, it is a phase lead controller because you can check this by the um, body plot of fs for example or i you i like to use the following i place the poles and zeros and if i uh, if you uh, are plotting a root locus, you connect from pole to the zero, you have this arrow here, and if this is looking towards the uh, origin, then it is a lead controller. If it's, for example, like this, then it is a lag controller. That's what, how I differentiate them most of the time. So, um, if we have placed the poles and zeros here, 
let me again use another color uh, we end up in pulls here and here because 2j and minus 2j and minus 2 was our design point so these are the closed loop pulls here and then uh, we will end up in uh, let me see I know that one of the poles should be uh, at minus one and the other one should be at minus uh, eight because we have s squared plus nine s plus eight so this was s s eight and one equals zero and equals zero so one is at minus one and minus eight the other one is minus eight so we have a pole here and a further left one namely here and of course we have the zero this is also a closed loop zero so one pole here one zero here the dominant ones and then at minus eight again in terms of dominant pole placement a lot of uh, is going on in the dominant region and it seems like the pole and zero here are even more dominant than the other ones so yeah now the root locus hope that this time i can plot it uh, here so there's a branch here between the uh, origin and the zero here and then there will be a branch here and then this one uh, let's see the one at minus five so Um, yeah, wait a second. So we have one at minus two, the one at minus five, but okay, 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 okay. We have also at minus six. So uh, because we are adding one uh, pole at minus six, I somehow forgot about that, forgot about that. So this one goes left there. These are the branches. And then we will have a breakaway point here and that'll go through this here something like this I'm not really good at plotting this this would be the root locus plot if we plot the root locus of s plus 1.45 divided by s plus 6 times um, 1 divided by or 100 divided by depending on your choice s times s plus 2 s plus 5 so we have four poles so that was what why i was confused uh, this one uh, is one of the open loop poles this one is the uh, two poles of the system here and then we have an additional pole because we have a first order system we've designed a first order system at minus six therefore these are the branches we have a break breakaway point this pole tends to this zero these two uh, meet up and they uh, go up to 90 uh, degrees or I guess not 90 degrees, this should be 60 degrees, because we have one zero and four poles. The asymptotes should be at 60, 180, and 300 degrees. Therefore, these are not really that uh, like that, but they rather tend to 60 degrees, to be more correct. So that's kind of the root locus plot and the um, red pole and zero pair uh, belongs to the controller the dark greenish color here are the closed loop uh, poles or pole locations and zero locations here so now um, of course this is not the only choice uh, you can uh, experiment with this uh, to try to come up with a controller but what you also can do is you can choose a parameter here and end up in the parametric solution because we have one variable that can be chosen as the free variable we can use that for example you can choose k to be the free variable here um, and try to work out what a uh, b and z and what else do we have? And P look like uh, in terms of K. 
Now, if of course this is not uh, that straightforward, you have to work for uh, this a little bit. Uh, and this is also not a good example because we have a phase lead controller. If we would uh, define this uh, a bit more like the PID controllers, then this task becomes really easy because we have used poles and zeros. We have multiplication of KZ, um, which is not linear, but everything else seems all right in this case because the only nonlinearity is because of the K and Z multiplication here. So you can work out what K looks like. It's a bit of uh, work, but you can do that. And once you have that, you can examine in terms of stability because we know that A should be positive and B should be positive. And of course, P can be negative, by the way, which is also interesting. You can add an unstable pole, even though it's not really preferred. You can do that as soon as uh, the closed loop is uh, stable. You can also choose a, a pole on the right half plane. But we'd like to have, again, um, uh, stable uh, controllers and stable systems and stable closed loop systems in terms of internal stability. But yeah, that's also a theoretical choice that we can have here. By the way, let me also show you a different definition of this first order uh, controller, phase lead or phase lag. We can define the controller as fs equals k times s plus z divided by s plus p. But if we don't want to change the gain, because if you plug in s equals 0, so limit s tends to 0, fs would be equal to kz kz divided by p. But if you want to have this equal to 1, because sometimes if we design phase lead controllers or phase lag controllers, uh, I'm just uh, generally speaking here, uh, we might not want to uh, change the gain of the system. Actually, for phase lead we want to, but for phase lag controllers, for example, we might want to avoid that. But nonetheless, I want to just show you a, a definition that has gain 1. So, of course, looking at this, you might uh, want to uh, have gain 1. And if you want to do that, instead of having k times s plus z divided by s plus p, what you can do is you can just use alpha s plus 1 divided by alpha, um, beta s plus 1. Now, if you plug in limit s tends to 0 into this one, we'll see that we get end up in 1. So this might be helpful, and if you're asking yourself where are the zeros and poles, well, at minus 1 divided by alpha, we have a 0, and at minus 1 divided by beta, we have a pole. So uh, just, to be, uh, just to give you a, a note here, if you want to have gain 1 first order controller, you might want to choose this uh, instead of choosing uh, k times s plus z divided by s plus p. Sometimes we design phase lead controllers on top of p-type controllers, therefore this might be helpful. So we have actually concluded our to discussion of today. Now let me uh, recap uh, quickly. We have worked our way out for the p-type controller stability and we've seen that there are numerous ways to come up with the stability interval to determine the stability interval. One of them was to use the root locus, the gain condition. If it's satisfying the gain condition, we can then find what the p-type controller looks like. And we were looking for the origin crossing and j-omega crossing. Then we looked at the root tabulation method, which is also possible uh, and which is also available to us. Or we have used the direct substitution based on the fact that we are looking for s equals j omega. We've plugged in s equals j omega, we've took the uh, real part and imaginary part, we've equated to them to zero and solved them, and we ended up in both the uh, lower bound and upper bound of the k uh, p-time controller value. Now then, we've transitioned into designing a p-time controller. The requirements were a little bit different than the ones in the laboratory, 
And the reason behind that was that we wanted to introduce you to the rise time and peak time. If you uh, don't know what they are, we have shown you them. So it is possible to use any two um, transients parameters to come up with a zeta and omega n values or sigma and omega d values. These are polar coordinates, these are Cartesian coordinates. Then we've seen that designing a p-type controller for this rise time and this peak time specific uh, was not possible due to the uh, choice of point was not on the root locus. Therefore, we uh, saw that the angle condition was not satisfied. We had a 200 and thumb thing that was not equal to 180 degrees. We've also seen that using the algebraic method, it is also possible to see that it is not possible to solve a three equation for a three equation to unknown set of equations. Now then, using the root locus method, it was possible to conclude that we needed a, a PD type controller uh, which, by the way, has the same effect as the phase lead controller because it is subtracting from the angle. So the PD controller or phase lead controller can be designed to, for this system, which is kind of obvious. Now we've designed a PD con type controller based on the fact that we have a angle condition to satisfy and we had a angle uh, contribution, a negative angle contribution to come up with. We've calculated the angle contribution. We also uh, have found out where to place a zero for uh, the root locus to path through the design point, and then we've designed the P-type uh, controller on top of that, which ended up in being a PD-type controller. We've also seen that the algebraic method is also possible to use for a PD-type controller design. Now, in terms of PI-type controller, we've used the algebraic method, and we've seen that the closed loop is not stable. Therefore, we have uh, concluded that it's not possible to design a PI-type controller for this requirements and this system because we end up in uh, an unstable closed loop. And then we've talked about the model matching controller and uh, how this relates to basically uh, the control with the inverse of the system or the pole zero cancellation method. And we've seen that the model matching controller gets rid of all the po poles of the system and zeros of the systems and then adds the uh, appropriate loop transfer function if we are looking for the root locus, we've seen that we need to choose two points, two poles at certain positions in order to end up with this zeta omega n pair or sigma omega d pair. And then we've talked about phase lead controller. In this uh, case, we uh, could have designed the phase lead controller uh, because we had infinite amount of solutions. We've just chosen one arbitrary solution out of the possible solutions, and we've seen that we can come up with a phase lead controller. And uh, to compare, we were able to design a PD type controller, a model matching controller, and phase lead controller. You can check out the PDF notes that I'm going to upload, where you can see all the details and the better plots and sketches of the root locuses, which I couldn't uh, actually deliver that good in this session here. But this concludes our session. Uh, good luck in your exam. Hope that this video was 